All right. So like I said, uh, we're getting now into the easier part of the course where a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about are what we, would, we might call trivial stuff. Trivial in the sense that it's a case of there's nothing to figure out. It's either you know it or you don't. So it either is or isn't. Okay. So we're going to talk about the elements and the way they're organized to, that helps us understand uh, uh, patterns in their behavior. Okay. So the periodic table is a chart that tabulates the elements in a manner that facilitates understanding of the trends and similarities in their properties. You'll notice they're not arranged in a periodic table alphabetically, okay? And so there's a reason for that. Now, uh, so we just need to be familiar with some of the terminologies. Uh, our horizontal row of elements in a periodic table is called a period, okay? Anytime you say row, we really mean horizontal, okay? A column would be a vertical, uh, actually when we say column, we always mean vertical. So a column of elements in the periodic table is called a group or a family. So here's an example. Which of the following belongs to period three? Actually, this is a clicker question. So sodium is over here. And scandium is over here. And indium is over here. which belongs to period three. What did we say a period was? Okay. So are we clickering this or we'll just move on? It's too simple to, for a clicker question. Okay. So period one, period two, period three. So sodium is the answer. Okay. This is column three, okay? So scandium is in column three, what we call column three or three B, and indium is in column three A, right? Okay. You can classify elements as being part of a main or representative group. And so these groups, remember we said elements in the same column belong to the same group, right? So uh the groups that are ref referred to as the main or representative groups are columns one two and 13 through 18. traditionally these are numbered 1a 2a 3a and so on in the traditional american periodic table okay so if you look at this chart right here you'll notice okay uh column one two 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, those are your main groups. And you'll also notice that they have alternate labels there, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. Sometimes 8A is also labeled as group zero, okay? So those are your main groups or representative groups. Now, columns three through 12, of your periodic table, those are your transition elements. So those groups are known as the transition groups. Traditionally, they're numbered with a B designation, 3B all the way to 8 and then 1B, all right? So if you go, go back to this table, right, example table we have here, these are your transition groups. You'll notice the numbering, so column 3 all the way to column 12, okay? So column 3 is 3B, and then you have 4B, 5B, 6B, 7B, and then 8B, there's three of those. The next three columns are labeled 8B, and then 11 is called 1B, and 12 is called 2B. Okay? I believe in the old... Uh, this, these are traditional labels in the American periodic table. I believe at that time, the European periodic table had these all labeled with A's and these had all labeled with B. So as a compromise, the, not the, uh, just to avoid any ambiguity, we, it's now preferred to just refer to these columns as one, columns one through 18, okay? All right, now, there's, uh, in addition 
to this, you have what are known as the inner transition elements. These are your lanthanides and your actinides, and these are the ones down here, okay? So lanthanides are, in fact, part of period six, and actinides are, in part, are actually part of period seven. So let's look at that chart right here that we have. Um, uh, that, I don't have that there. Let me pull up a bigger periodic table. Uh, actually, I have one somewhere. A nicer one. No, I don't. Let me go ahead and pull up a nice periodic table for you. You do webelements.com, maybe. You go to webelements.com. You'll notice on this periodic table right here, okay, period six, row number six, jumps from 56 to 71. There's a jump in the numbering there, okay, and that's because 57 through 70 is down here. So you can think of the lanthanoids or lanthanides as having been pulled out of period six down here just to make your table short enough to fit on a standard size paper. And from the actinides, this second column of ele this second row of elements right here, actually belongs to period seven. See, it follows number eighty-eight here. After eighty-eight, you have eighty-nine down here, all the way to one hundred and two, and then the numbering picks up over here at one hundred and three. So those are your actinides. So this group right here, these uh, these two rows of elements down there are known as the uh, inner transition elements. Okay. Where was I? All right, so classifying elements as main transition or inner transition. So some groups that you should know because they're given special names and you just need to be familiar with them because we refer to them a lot. Uh, column 1A, with the exception of hydrogen, are known as the alkali metals, okay? Column 2A are known as the alkaline earth metals, or group 2A. The noble gases is group 8A. And group 17, or column 7A, are known as the halogens, okay? And group 6A, right here, the that's headed by oxygen are known as the chalcogens. All right, so those are just some special names that you need to be familiar with for the groups. Uh, you can also classify elements according to their, their metallic characteristics. And on the periodic table, you'll find what we call metallic elements on the left side right here. Most of the elements, if they you can find them in pure form they will, be, under ordinary conditions, they will be metallic. So those are, that's bl that block of elements that I, met, I highlighted there are metallic under ordinary conditions, okay? The ones on, that are shaded here in gray are non-metallic, non-metals, are called non-metals. And the ones that are not shaded in between, those are what you call your metalloids. They have characteristics somewhere be, uh, that tend to be sort of metallic, sort of non-metallic, so somewhere in between, okay? Now, what makes something metallic? Well, what would we consider as metallic? Uh, one char characteristic that metals have in common is they're all shiny, okay? So you've seen a shiny piece of silver, gold, copper, those are shiny. They are malleable, that means you can hammer them into thin sheets. So an example of a metal that comes to you in thin sheets that you find at home would be one. Aluminum foil, so aluminum is right here, where's aluminum? Right here, there's aluminum right there. They're ductile, that means you can draw them out into a thin wire, like a piece of copper is used for electrical wiring, okay? They're good electrical conductors, and they're also very good heat conductors, okay? And like I said, these uh, groups right here in between that are not shaded are your metalloids. They have characteristics halfway, be uh, that's, that's partly metallic and partly non-metallic. And the most important ones you'll find there in that group is silicon, okay? And uh, you've heard of computer chips, 
uh, being referred to as semiconductors, being made of semiconductors. So they're all based on silicon. Okay, so it's not as good an electrical conductor as metals. That's why they're semiconductors. All right. Uh, there are some metals that you'll find just after the transition metal. So you'll notice this is, these are your transition metals right here. The metals that come after that, gallium, indium, so this is gallium, indium, tin, thallium, lead, and bismuth. These are referred to as your post-transition metals. They're not transition metals. They're actually main groups. Remember, these are the A groups. These are representative or main groups. So they are main group metals, but they come immediately after the transition metals. So they're referred to as post-transition metals. All the transition elements, if you notice, they're all metals. So transition elements are also known as transition metals. So here's a clicker question. Which element is a good electrical conductor? Copper which is over here, germanium, which is over here, or krypton, which is over here. Very good. Metals are good electrical conductors. Germanium is a non-metal and krypton. Ah, germanium is a metalloid and krypton is a non-metal. Very good. Uh, physical states of elements. Under ordinary conditions, okay, this is a nice periodic table because this one shows you the physical states that you'll find the elements under ordinary conditions. So, You'll notice most elements are solids under ordinary conditions, so it's color-coded white on this periodic table. All right. Now, the elements that under ordinary conditions you're going to find in nature as gaseous are these right here, color-coded in red. So you got hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. The noble gases are gases under ordinary conditions. There are only two elements that are liquids under ordinary conditions, and those are mercury and bromine, okay? Now, if it gets a little warmer, over 30 degrees Celsius, like what, what would a uh, hot summer day, you might find cesium as a liquid, okay? Its melting point is very close to room temperature, just above room temperature, so if it gets very hot, then you might find cesium as a liquid, okay? Uh, in fact, you can look up the melting point of cesium. You can look up a lot of the properties of these elements from webelements.com. Let me see if I can find cesium. Um, cesium's right here. Okay. Melting point of cesium is, where is that? Properties of cesium. It's a solid at 298K, but it melts slightly above that temperature. There must be a melting point right here. Physical properties. It melts at okay, 89 degrees Fahrenheit, 28.44 degrees Celsius. So uh, 83 degrees Fahrenheit. So on a warm summer day, you'll find cesium as a liquid. Okay. All right. Uh, and then here you have um, the ones in yellow, technetium, and all these other ones, mostly the heavy elements, okay? Those are not naturally occurring. They're all artificially prepared. That means those are elements that you'll only be able to make in the lab, at least. Okay, so uh, those are color-coded in yellow right there. Now, I said that we can use a periodic table to, to help us predict trends in properties of the elements, similarities in the properties of the elements. Uh, so here's one that you can predict based on the periodic table. If you remember cations, what are cations? There's a positively charged ions, right? So the typical monatomic cations you'll get, you can predict in uh, by looking at the periodic table. 
the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Okay, if you find these as ions in nature, you'll find that they'll always have a charge of plus one. Okay, so if you find it as a part of a compound, it's a positively charged cation with a charge of plus one. You'll never find sodium with a charge of plus two in nature. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot make sodium with a charge of plus two. It can be done in the lab, but it, that, that's not going to be stable. So when we say when we say it's always plus one, we mean in nature. If you find it in nature as an ion, it will have a charge of plus one. Alkaline earth metals always find them in nature with a plus two charge. So group two A plus two, group one A plus one makes that easy to remember. Aluminum is always plus three. If you find it in nature with a charge with a pos with a charge, it's going to have a charge of plus three. All right now. The transition and the post-transition metals, okay, uh, most of these uh, you'll find with a plus two. The most common charge is plus two, but they can vary. Some can have plus one, plus two, plus three, or plus four. Okay, so for example, iron, you might find it in nature with a plus two charge or with a plus three charge. Okay, so the, the iron with a plus two charge so to make a distinction between those, you call this first one iron, and then in parentheses you put Roman numeral two to indicate that you're dealing with the iron that has a charge of plus two. And for this one with a plus three charge, you would call this iron Roman numeral three in parentheses after the name. Okay, so that those are the two two common uh, ions that you'll find in nature for iron. Zinc, cadmium, and mercury are almost always plus two, okay? Pretty much always plus two in nature. So uh, if you have ions of zinc, cadmium, or mercury, you can pretty much say uh, no, those will have a charge of plus two. A typical monatomic cation. So what would be, let's, let's write some symbols here then. Uh, sodium, what would be the symbol for sodium? Sodium ion, if I ask you for the symbol for sodium ion, what would be the charge that I have to put? Just one plus, right? How about potassium? Here's potassium right here. K, K plus. Calcium. Here's calcium right here. Group 2A. Two plus. Okay. Barium. BA two plus. Aluminum. Aluminum is always found in nature. If it fi you find it as an ion in nature, it will have a charge of. Okay. And zinc's always found in nature to have a charge of plus two. Okay. All right. Names of cations. If you're dealing with a main group cation, the name of the ion is just the same as the main, the name of the atom itself. So Na is sodium atom, and A plus is sodium ion. They're both called sodium. Okay, so calcium, the atom is called calcium. Calcium, the ion, is called cal also called calcium. So they share the same element. How do you know you're referring to the ion or the atom? That will have to depend on the context, okay, that you're mentioning them. Uh, as far as transition and post-transition cations, so monatomic cations derived from transition and post-transition metals. The name of the, uh, the ion is just the name of the element, but you specify the charge in Roman numerals in parentheses. So if I see cobalt, I've, if you look at the periodic table, you'll see cobalt is a transition element. So cobalt with a plus three charge, the ion itself is called cobalt three. So And you write it cobalt, open parenthesis, Roman numeral three, and there is no space in between the T and the open parenthesis. You don't type the space bar if you were typing it, okay? So immediately after the T, T you, write, you write the open parenthesis, and then Roman numeral 3, and then close parenthesis. So 
Which of the following would you call magnesium ion? Here's magnesium, group 2A. Click our question. Very good. Okay. All of these are ions of magnesium, but the one that we call magnesium ion is the one that we find in nature, and that's the one that has a charge of plus two. Good. Group 2A, plus two. What's the formula for lead four ion? So IV is Roman numeral four, so that means I have to write it as PB. Lead is PB, two plus. Okay. By the way, you know why PB is a symbol for lead? No, it's uh, from the Latin name plumbum, as in plumbing, lead pipes. All right. Nonmetals are the ones that belong to group 5A, 6A, and 7A. So what are those? 5A, 6A. So all the nonmetals include carbon, right? Phosphorus, arsenic. So here's your nine metals right here. And then those that belong to 5A, 6A, and 7A. So nitrogen and phosphorus right here would have a charge of negative 3. Naturally occurring monatomic ions you'll find would always be negative 3. Negative 2 for group 6A. So oxygen, if you find it in nature, as a negative, it will be a negative ion. A, a monatomic ion, it's going to be negatively charged with a charge of negative 2. And the halogens are found in nature with a charge of negative 1 if you find them as monatomic ions. Okay, so negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. And uh, the names of these ions are different from the name of the element itself. What you do is you change the ending to I. So if you're referring to the atom, fluorine, the symbol uh, symbolized by F, but if you're referring to the ion with fluorine with a negative one charge, it's not called fluorine anymore, it's called fluoride. Okay? So what happens to oxygen? If it forms a monatomic ion in nature, you'll always find it to have a charge of negative two. So the symbol for the oxygen ion that you'll find in nature will be O with a negative two charge, so O2 minus, and you call this Ox, instead of oxygen, it's now called oxide. And nitrogen, okay, column 5A, would have a charge of negative 3, and you don't call it nitrogen anymore, you call it nitride. Okay. So let's look at some, let's try some symbols here. Bromide, what's the symbol for bromide? Br, what, what, what charge? Negative one, okay, so the charge is minus. Nitride, we just did this earlier. Negative three. Sulfide, where is sulfide? Right here. Right below oxygen. So it's gonna have a charge of negative two, so S, sulfide is S, two minus. Iodide, down here, I with a charge of, these halogens have a charge of negative one, okay? So fluoride, bromide, chloride, iodide, these are what you would call your halides, okay? The negative ions derived from the halogens, they're called the halides. So here's a summary of the typical ions that you can get, you can find in nature. If you find these ions in nature, oops, excuse me. 
So group 1A is plus 1, group 1B, 2A is plus 2, aluminum is plus 3. Transition and post-transition varies, mostly plus 2, it can be from plus 1 to plus 4, you can have more than one possible charge. 5A, the nitrogen and the phosphorus would give you negative 3. The chalcogens will give you negative 2, the halogens will give you negative 1. Okay, so that's a summary of the typical ions that you get in nature from monatomic ions that you get in nature from these atoms. Okay, type of bonding. Okay. Uh, Nonmetals and metalloids have a tendency to share electrons with other nonmetal atoms and metalloids. Okay, so the atoms that are sharing electrons, remember we said they're said to be in a covalent bond. It's what keeps the atoms together in molecules and polyatomic ions. Now, nonmetals also tend to gain electrons so they can gain they can either share electrons among themselves or they if they're interacting with atoms of a metal then their tendency is to gain electrons from the metal ion metal atoms okay and then once that transfer has been done okay so here's a metal it loses an electron so an electron jumps from a metal to a non-metal so let's let me put a non-metal here so if that elect one electron jumps from a metal to a non-metal, this becomes positive, this becomes negative. So once ions are formed, these ions tend to attract each other, so they end up being held together in what's called an ionic bond. So the ionic bond is what holds ions together, okay? Uh, if, you, if you have atoms that are sharing electrons, then we say they are being held together by a covalent bond. Now. Metals may form covalent bond with other atoms. For example, in polyatomic ions, chromate, okay, it's actually sharing electrons with the oxygen atoms. Okay, so uh, metals, they do tend to lose uh, electrons. They tend to form cations, as we talked about earlier. Sodium has a tendency to just lose an electron, become a plus one charge. But uh, transition, post-transition metals in particular, they can, in addition to forming positive ions, they also can form covalent bonds, okay? So a pair of mercuries can, in fact, form a covalent bond and give you a polyatomic, a diatomic ion called mercury-1. HG2 with a plus-2 charge, okay, refers to a, uh, a pair of mercuries with a plus-2 charge. So this mer particular mercury I ion right here, we call this mercury 1, Roman numeral 1, or mercurus ion. The official name is mercury Roman numeral 1, okay? So the formula for mercury 1, this is the only exception uh, to the naming that we, we talked about earlier, okay? Remember we said that the, the Roman numeral tells you the charge, not in the case of mercury 1. Okay, mercury one is act is not Hg with a plus one charge. That does not exist in nature. Okay, a monatomic ion of mercury with a plus one charge does not exist in nature. What you find in nature is a mercury with a plus two charge, which is mercury two, or a pair of mercuries with a plus two charge. So that pair of mercury atoms are held together by a covalent bond. Okay. So that, that's what we call a mercurous ion. So it's always written as Hg2 with a plus 2 charge. Okay. You can also form what are known as complex ions. So copper, for example, okay, if you have a water molecule nearby, a water molecule would look something like this. It has an oxygen with two lone pairs and two single bonds with the hydrogen. These lone pairs on the oxygen could end up being shared with a copper ion. Okay, that has a plus two charge. So if you have four of these water molecules sharing with the copper, you have what's called a, so this can end up being a covalent bond right here. You have what's called a complex ion. This particular one is called tetraamine copper two ion. Uh, we're not gonna worry about what to call it at this point. Okay, but that's an example of what's called a complex ion. So you have little molecules that can actually form covalent bond with transition metal ions. That's called, those are called complex ions. Okay, so uh, compounds where you find metals forming covalent bonds are known as, typically known as coordination compounds. So this bonding right here, this sharing of electrons is called coordinate covalent bonding.
the sharing of electrons between the water molecule and a copper ion in this complex ion is called coordinate covalent bonding. Okay? It's covalent bonding, sharing of electrons, except that it appears as though, you know, the copper is a freeloader there. The, it's, the electrons are all coming from the water molecule. So we add that uh, term there called uh, uh, the adjective coordinate in front of the name covalent bonding. Now, in a solid piece of metal, okay, the electrons are very loosely held among the atoms. So you can imagine in a... Uh, in a piece of metal, a solid piece of metal, you can ha imagine the nuclei of the atoms as just buried in a sea of electrons. So electrons are so loosely held, okay? So if I have some nuclei here, okay, in a piece of metal, then the electrons are very loosely held, are more or less free to move about. And that's why metals are very good electrical conductors. So the bonding, okay, that we say that holds these metal atoms together is what we call metallic bonding. So that happens among a, a large collection of metal atoms in a solid. But between a pair of metal atoms like here, okay, a couple of mercuries, that bonding is covalent bonding. Okay. There are some elements that are typically found in nature okay, as a collection of molecules rather than as a single atoms. So you just need to memorize these. Fluor the halogens are always found in nature to be diatomic. So fluorine, the substance fluorine that you find in nature will be diatomic. Two F atoms bonded together with a covalent bond between them. Chlorine, Cl2. Bromine is Br2. Iodine is I2. Oxygen is also diatomic, so it's nitrogen, hydrogen. There's some that you might find as polyatomic in nature. So phosphorus is P4. And sulfur, the phosphorus, the four phosphorus atoms in P4 are arranged in the form of a pyramid. Okay, so each phosphorus atom is sharing a pair of electrons with an, with three other phosphorus atoms. So this is a pick, about single bond. That's another single bond. This is another single bond. And then sulfur is found in nature as S8, one of the many forms of sulfur. S8. Okay, it looks like uh, this. It's, each sulfur has a, two lone pairs and two single bonds. So there's eight carbon atoms. So look, imagine looking at a stop sign, and there's a lone pair on each of those sulfur atoms. So that's S8 molecule. Okay. Graphite, uh, uh, diamond, okay can be considered as just one giant molecule. So if, you, if, if there's one molecule that you've already seen, all mole most molecules are small. If there's one molecule that you've already seen, that's a diamond. That's one giant molecule. All the atoms there are covalently bonded to, uh, each carbon atom is covalently bonded to four other carbon atoms. And it's just one big uh, collection of covalently bonded atoms. Same thing with graphite, OK? Um, uh, they, those are also covalently bonded carbon atoms. The difference between graphite and diamond is in the way that the atoms are arranged. In the, in the case of graphite, they're in sheets of giant molecules known as graphene. Okay. So imagine uh, a hexagon. Each corner here is a carbon atom. Okay. And so imagine all of these hexagons fused together. Another hexagon here, another hexagon here, another hexagon here. So if you imagine each corner of these hexagons represents a carbon atom. So you imagine a very flat sheet, a very big flat sheet of this. You have, at each corner you have a carbon atom. That is called a graphene molecule. So the pencil, the lead in your pencil that you use to write with. Yes, we'll stop after this one. Our, the lead in your pencil is called graphite. It's made up of layers of these graphene molecules. So when you write on a piece of paper, you're laying down a uh, graphene on your uh, on your paper. Okay. Uh, molecules in the ozone layer that protects us from the harmful rays of the sun are triatomic. So oxygen can also be found in nature as triatomic. So these different forms of the elements in nature, they're referred to as the allotropic forms of the elements. Okay. So oxygen, the allotropic forms are O2 and O3. 
graphene and diamond are allotropic forms of diamond. I think we'll have to stop here. We'll continue this next time. All right. And so will I.